Welcome everyone. It's great to see so many folks here today. We're going to get started. We have a great program for you. Hopefully everyone's uh, made their way to the buffet to grab a sandwich. If you haven't, it's dire directly behind you. You can access it by either of these two doors. And uh, bathrooms are just outside this door to the right if uh, you need them. So good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney. I'm president of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and it is my pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you, Mayor. Big fan. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to another edition of Good Day Metro South. Uh, it's so nice to gather here on this beautiful campus of Stonehill College. Uh, today we help them, them celebrate 75 years of service to students and the community at large here at Stonehill. So this is 75 years that this college has been here and you've seen the growth uh, just by way of hands, uh, how many alums do we have in the audience? Quite a few, about a dozen. And uh, how many folks here on the campus for the very first time? I know, Secretary, you, you yep, quite a few, another, another two dozen, so that's terrific. That's why we have events like this as a Chamber of Commerce. We want you to see the economic impact of organizations like this, employers, not just employers, but people who are, are training our, our future workers. Uh, and I'll tell you, in, in meeting Evan, did anybody meet Evan on the way in, the student coordinator here? Where is he? Uh, ter terrific young man, uh, hopefully going on to law school. Evan, round of applause, Evan, our future graduates. So I want to thank uh, Professor Katie Coral Dykeman. She is the director here of the Martin Institute, and also Doug Smith, who's the vice president of advancement for their generous support of today's program. Let's have a round of applause for Stonehill. You know, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, you to join me in a moment of silence in memory of uh, Massachusetts native Christopher Chambers and Nathan Gage. Uh, both of those young men uh, are Navy SEALs, were Navy SEALs who passed away uh, this, earlier this month uh, in the Red Sea. Uh, many of you probably saw that story, but maybe didn't know Christopher Chambers was from uh, Massachusetts. So let's have a, a moment of silence uh, in memory of these two SEALs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Today we are pleased to host Massachusetts Secretary of Housing Edward Augustus and Chris Bond, owner of Time's Up and also alumni here uh, from, alumnus I guess, from Stonehill College. Uh, we will first hear from Chris Bond about many things to consider when deciding to sell your business. It's a topic that's increasingly uh, in the news and increasingly uh, at the forefront of many of our discussions and uh, for those of you who are considering it, it, it can be a maze in terms of how to sell your business. Uh, so Chris is going to talk to us a little bit about that and then we will also hear from the Master Secretary of Housing uh, regarding a bold new plan to build 200,000 units of new housing uh, in 10 years within the state of Massachusetts uh, by deploying over four billion dollars uh, in incentives and tax credits uh, during that time. So this is a time to be here and understand what's going on and how this is happening. Uh, it is great to have so many people with us here today to learn firsthand about this housing plan, especially the many developers who have uh, combined to build thousands of new housing units already in the city of Brockton. Many of those developers are here today. We ask them to be here. Please, uh, give, please uh, raise your hand if you're a developer that's developed something in the city of Brockton. We have a table. round of applause. These are the folks that are doing it and have done it as well as the bankers in the room who are helping to finance it. Uh, these developers have built or renovated more than a dozen or so buildings recently in downtown Brockton, and there are several blocks to go. Uh, with the rail uh, train, uh, commuter rail coming up from Fall River to Bedford starting later this year, there's going to be a lot more opportunity for economic development and housing in the city of Brockton. Finally, we can put the sign up saying, if you lived here, you'd already be here, right? Uh, so. <laughs> Please join me in a round of applause um, for the builders. Again, just uh, I want to acknowledge them. We have a very full program today, so I encourage you to continue enjoying your lunch as we continue the speaking program. Uh, I would like to point out there are green half pages on the center of each table. Uh, that's for questions uh, for Secretary Augustus if we have time. Uh, if you have a question, please write it out and just wave it in the air and a chamber ambassador or Emma and Naldo on the chamber staff uh, will be around to grab it and we'll bring it up and make sure we get it in the queue. All right, it's now my, my pleasure to introduce our MC for today. Please join me in welcoming Chair of the Chamber Board of Directors, 
Rich Hines, he is CEO of Barber Corporation. Barber Corporation is a family-owned business and has operated in Brockton for more than 130 years, manufacturing shoe welting, plastic extrusion products, uh, and marine industry components here in Brockton. And uh, it's also its newer facility in Atlanta, Georgia. Please help me welcome Rich Hines. He's right here. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here on this wonderful, sunny winter day. Glad you could all make it. Uh, just such a pleasure for me to be here, and it's, it's always great to see such a, a good turnout at these uh, Chamber events. I'd like to start by thanking our Chamber ambassadors that are here today. Jose Camacho, Dedham Savings, Catherine Light, Eastern Bank, Emmanuel Edenhen, Overbar, Brockton Redevelopment Authority, Felicita Supulvila, uh, the Cape Verdean Association, Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank, Brenda Karen, Old Colony Elder Services. I'd also like to uh, thank the Chamber Board members uh, here today. Susan Joss, the Brockton Neighborhood Health Association, Doug Smith, Stonehill College, and Jenny Mather, Mather uh, JM Pet Resort. Finally, I'd like to Finally, I'd like to uh, thank our elected, selected, and state officials uh, here today. Uh, Mayor Bob Sullivan, uh, Shirley, Shirley Asek, Brockton City Council, Jack Lally, Brockton City Council, Stephanie Danielson, Town Planner of Easton, uh, Connor Reed, Town Administrator of uh, Easton as well, uh, Leanne Bradley, Acting Town Planner, Middleborough, uh, Lisa Green, Town Administrator of Hanson, uh, Senator Walter Timothy, uh, Senator Mike Brady, uh, Senator John Keenan. Today's uh, Good Day Metro South program uh, is being hosted by the Martin Institute here at Stonehill College. Uh, the Joseph Martin Institute for Law and Society was established in the memory of Joseph Martin, Jr., who lived from 1884 or 1968. He was a former Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, as a congressman representing a nearby district, Speaker Martin had a close relationship uh, with the college and received an honorary doctorate uh, of letters in 1955. In 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed into the law uh, legislation for the creation of an institute uh, at Stonehill College. Uh, the Martin Institute uh, honored uh, uh, Mr. Martin uh, with congressional funding. Um, and that was back in 1990. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our host today, Doug Smith, Vice President for Advancement, Stonehill College, to say a few words. Doug. Thanks, Rich, and welcome everyone. It is so good to see you here this afternoon. As Chris mentioned earlier, uh, welcome to our friends, our alumni who are in the room. It was great to see so many of our alums here with us today. Uh, and as he also mentioned, the college is celebrating its 75th anniversary. So we humbly began in 1948 with about 75 students. Most of them were men who were returning from World War II, were at Stonehill in the GI Bill. And we had about 13 faculty members, most of whom were members of the Congregation of Holy Cross. Uh, today we have 2,500 students, all wonderful like Evan, who you met earlier here today, and close to 30,000 alumni. So our success has been wonderful over the past 75 years. And I thought I would share with you a short video that celebrates our 75th anniversary. So if all goes well, Emma will hit the right button and you can enjoy the video, thank you. Looking down the iconic hill, outside of what would come to be known as Donahue Hall, the founders of Stonehill College in 1948 may never have envisioned how the vista would evolve over 75 years. But they did have a clear vision of what they wished for their new college and those it educated to lead with heart. For 75 years, 
That vision and guiding principle established by the Congregation of Holy Cross continues to inspire this Catholic college, its students, and its alumni as they crest ever higher summits and work toward creating a more just and compassionate world. It is also one of the most profound ways we honor the college's motto, Lux et Spes, Light and Hope. Members of this community work tirelessly to leverage the values and character at the heart of a Stonehill education to bring light and hope to the world around them. As we celebrate this milestone, we honor our legacy by pushing toward new summits and opening our hearts even wider to ensure that as we continue to rise, we lift. Thank you, thank you for being here with us today. And as we mentioned, you know, our motto, Luxet Spes, Light and Hope. And that's what we hope Stonehill College can bring to the Brockton, Easton, and our entire community. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Rich. This time, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our interviewer for today's program, Attorney Masa Kambabi. Kambabi Immigration Law, uh, and uh, she is going to be interviewing our corporate sponsor today, and that's Jennifer Carey, Account Executive and Municipal Liaison for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Please welcome Masa and Jennifer. So we feel that chambers play a really important role in gathering that membership, like we are doing here today, um, uh, to support each other and network. And uh, we feel it's important for me to be here to hear challenges and um, successes and the needs of the folks here in the room. And as I look at the membership list on your website and look at the faces in the room here, uh, I do see partners of ours, City of Brockton, um, the Old Colony YMCA, Barber, Corporation, BMZ, lots of other small businesses, so uh, we do feel it's important to be here to, to share that with you guys. You know, businesses and communities in the area are the heart of what we do every day at Cross. And so healthcare is always a tough concern for business leaders, for their employees um, in our region, and especially with a lot that we're hearing about healthcare institutions suffering financially and how that could impact uh, the community. What is Blue Cross doing to tackle the cost of health care, something that's so important to us? Well, we know the rising cost of health care is a major border burden to businesses and families. We work every day um, to ensure that everybody has the highest quality access to health care at the most affordable price. Um, we're doing all that we can to, to slow that rise in health care. Uh, 90, 90 cents on every premium dollar, it goes right back out the door to pay claims for medical costs and pharmacy, pharmacy claims. Um, it also uh, means we're negotiating prices with hospital systems and provider groups um, to keep costs lower. And we take advantage of um, looking for innovative programs that, that look for um, chronic health conditions and mental health conditions, then we incorporate those programs into our products every day so that we can get those costs low as well. Yes. Uh, and if healthcare cost is a big topic in the room, you know, we certainly can invite somebody from our leadership team to come to another event and, and tackle that in more detail if you're Thank you, yeah. Uh, diagnosing uh, and treating uh, a disease is often much more expensive than providing care and wellness in advance. So yes. it's great to see that Blue Cross Blue Shield is working on that. 
And so lastly, what is something that is person that has been personally meaningful to you in your I think 14 years of experience? Sure, that would be question. So a couple things. Um, I would say service day comes to mind. You know, every year Blue Cross Blue Shield um, empties all their offices and sends all their employees out to nonprofits across the Commonwealth and we volunteer for a full day and we really shut the office down for that. Um, so giving back to the community in those ways is really important to me. I'm also the kind of person that um, is not happy in my job if I'm not continually learning. And Blue Cross certainly um, has ample opportunities for me to do that. I've, I've moved across several departments, member service, provider service, employees. I'm now in the sales on the sales team, and I just feel that you know having those ample opportunities, I'll be able to continue working hard for everybody who's right up until my retirement years. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and share that with you, and look forward to getting to know, to know more of you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. As a token of our appreciation, we have this time for you, and we hope that retirement is not any time no, soon. Not too soon. I think our members enjoy hearing from you and working with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now we are pleased to have with us Chris Bond, owner of Times Up LLC will present a segment on business valuation. Chris Bond is a business broker with over 20 years of experience consulting small business owners in industrial uh, and service industries. Uh, Chris specializes in helping business people fully understand market conditions which allows them to make intelligent decisions as they transcend forward. His client list includes an impressive array of small companies that you've never heard of. Prior to forming Time's Up in 2009, Chris was a partner in Next Level Incorporated, a sales management and consulting firm and an affiliate of Sandler Trading. Uh, there he specialized in helping small business owners solve difficult sales challenges, in part through his co-founding of the globally influential web tool, Sales Accountability. It was this line of work that afforded Chris the unique insight into understanding an owner's drive to grow a business or to ultimately move on to a new phase of life. Chris earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in marketing from Stonehill College and lives with his wife in their rapidly emptying nest in Franklin. He's proud to have served on the Board of Directors for Small Business Brokers Alliance of New England uh, the United Regional Chamber of Commerce, and the Exit Planning Exchange, an association of professional business advisors. Please welcome Chris Bond. All small businesses have value. No small business should be shuttered and forgotten. And I hope in the next few minutes, too, demonstrate that to you. My thanks to Rich, to Chris for the invitation. And it's a privilege to be here, and I'm thrilled that the topic is housing, such a crucial topic. Looking forward to the Secretary's comments on that. And yet privilege and housing are meaningful topics to me as I come back to Stonehill College many years after leaving this campus, in that I didn't always enjoy the privilege of housing. <laughs> And it wasn't because there wasn't enough, it was because I had far too much fun. So arriving on campus in the fall of 1985, we discovered at orientation that it was a dry campus. Stona was known as a party school, play frisbee, have a great time, until the day the class of 1989 arrived. And yeah, we, we, we broke some rules and the head of housing and the dean of discipline huddled with me at a certain point uh, in my time here and said, we're thinking, go to, go to school here, definitely. Take, take intro to marketing, take financial management, definitely intro to computers, absolutely. Just go live anywhere but campus, please. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about why I believe all small businesses have value to someone, somewhere, at some time for some amount of money under certain terms and conditions and with certain representations and warranties. 
And there's a lot that goes into understanding how this all works. And this is a, there's a longer program out there on the Harbor One Bank website. Chris Cooney was a, was a member of the audience of a talk I did a few months ago for Harbor One. And that's what uh, earned me this nice opportunity to be with you, you today. The full program is on the Harbor One site. So please look for it there if this topic is at all meaningful for you. And if you're looking for more details, examples, the mathematics that go into understanding the value of a business and what it might take to sell it. People that acquire small businesses will uh, determine the value through their own eyes, right? Beauty, we know, is in the eyes of the beholder. And there are many things to value when looking at a small business. No, so picture my clients, they're, they're mom and pops, they're grandma and grandpa type operations. They tend to be in the trades, in industrials, <coughs> manufacturers, distributorships, services, companies. And these companies have been around for decades in a lot of cases. And they have built expansive customer lists. There are healthy databases there are service offerings. There's a particular geography that they operate in. All of these things might be valuable, but a business owner who works 40 to 45 hours a week, 40 to 50 hours a week, maybe far more, doesn't necessarily take the time to appreciate what it is that they've built and how that might be perceived as quite valuable to the buyer market. That buyer market includes uh, Folks that are in the same industry, that are maybe larger and looking to grow. Those might be smaller private equity firms or funds that are looking to break into a particular sector or industry. Those might be individuals who typically, when they turn 50 and realize their career is perhaps rapidly coming to a close or entering its final phase, decide I'm going to finally take the leap and acquire a small business. This is my last chance to be the boss, feet on the desk, newspaper, making my own hours, <laughs> working 20 hours a week, I'm the boss, right? So lots of different types of categories of buyers, and they all have their own point of view on what may or may not be valuable. So we need to appreciate and understand those things. Now, some people make the mistake, they hear that a business can be sold as a factor or a multiple of its income. And that is technically true, but not entirely clear. When we talk about a business's worth, a multiple of its income, that means it's adjusted bottom line, not it's ring the register top line. But I can't tell you how many people get confused by that. And, and when I'm introduced to them, very lucky to be introduced by CPAs and attorneys and bankers and CFOs and all kinds of financial planners in the Boston market. And they introduced me to a client who has heard in their social circles that a business can be sold on a multiple of its income. Bear in mind how confusing and misleading the math can get if somebody is taking a two or three or four times multiple of the top line, hey, we do a million dollars in revenue, a wonderful business as opposed to the adjusted bottom line. What do I mean by that? An adjusted bottom line is a, a pretty straightforward mathematical exercise. Declared net income on which you are taxed, plus things like personal or unusual expenses that are run through the business. Maybe there's somebody from the family that's on staff that doesn't really show up much or at all. Maybe there are some auto benefits or insurance benefits. Maybe there are some vacations that are tacked on to conferences that the company pays. All of those things need to be accounted for, added to net income to determine what's called the adjusted bottom line, adjusted earnings. That's what we're typically multiplying. So if you hear my business can be sold for two, three, four, maybe more times income, that's what's being suggested. It's a very rare business that sells for two, three, four, five times its top line. There are examples. Insurance, property and casualty insurance, if you know anything about that world, I don't. That's not my sector that, I, uh, that I've been involved in much at all, so I'm no expert in P&C insurance, but man, do I hear the numbers coming out of that industry. Friends that are in the industry that tell me that businesses are being sold, being acquired 
four, four, five, six times the top line, never mind the bottom line. CPA practices tend to be paid for over time, but you can get a multiple for an accounting practice, a dental practice. I don't know anything about that either, <laughs> but I've heard that dental practices can sell for healthy multiples. Insurance uh, or um, investment firms, similar to insurance agencies, will sell for a multiple. A couple quick examples of other industries where you might be able to get a multiple uh, of your top line. One, a corporate plant care company that I'm representing, we close a month from today, <laughs> God willing, a $4 billion publicly traded entity with a $150 million division is buying my client's corporate plant care company that grosses a million dollars for $1.1 million dollars, pretty good, 1.1 times its top line. Why? Because the 26th of the month, they hit the credit card for all their hundreds of accounts for the upcoming month. So it's not only predictable risk-free income, revenue, it's happening on a, on, a, on a rotation, on a regular schedule. And there's a very little like you would have with a with a property insurance, uh, property and casualty insurance agency or a CPA or a dental practice. There's very little cancellation rate in those. So you can get a multiple there. I just started a project for a husband and wife who have a 40-year-old pest control company. 40 years, the husband has been chasing mice around. <laughs> they got 800 families that sleep like babies at night knowing full well that the mice are under control. The mice population is being managed. They bill on an annual basis with a very small cancellation rate. So they can sell that business for two times the top line because hundreds of families reliably are paying the annual bill. So, but those are rare examples. So please, if you're a business owner and you're looking down the road and you're thinking about selling someday and you're wondering, what should I be multiplying again? <laughs> it's most likely the adjusted bottom line. It's kind of work that folks like me do, helping figure out what that is, and then helping figure out what the market is doing, and are people actually gonna be willing to pay that particular multiple? Buyers of small businesses have a primary goal, which is how do we minimize risk when acquiring this company? How do we make it so it's not so scary? How do we know that those customers are gonna stick around? How can we believe that uh, uh, for, for sure that uh, the revenue is going to continue to flow, that the earnings will be there. So they have a number of ways that they like to evaluate a business and make sure that those risk factors are, are under control. Things like, how financially stable is the business? Does, does the business have to rely on a line of credit? Do owners have to come out of pocket to make payroll? Those are important factors. How clean are the books? How reliable is the financial reporting? What is the condition of the, the bookkeeping services or the relationship with the CPA? How well diversified is this business? Both from a customer perspective, how many sectors are we getting business from? How many customers are in those sectors? What does the pie look like? Is any, is any particular customer or sector too big a slice of the pie for anybody to be comfortable? Suppliers, what, what's the diversification of where we get our supplies? Very important factors. Management. Who's running the business? When the owner is away, <laughs> can anybody reliably handle the concerns of running that particular business? Can the owner take a vacation? It's a major factor in determining how risky it is to take over a particular business. Industry trends. What's going on? Are, is there growth? Are there regulations that are around the corner? How, how, how do we see the next five or 10 years in this particular industry? How well do we know it ourselves if we're coming from another industry? or if we're in private equity, trying to create a new platform. Competition. What is going on in the local market, the regional market, that we have to be mindful of? All risk factors that people need to consider. And then lastly, I would invite you to consider uh, or, or uh, think about other considerations when looking at your business, or maybe you're even looking at other businesses. Maybe your path is you're planning on selling the business in 10 or 20 years, and along the way, you're gonna think about acquiring some smaller businesses to, uh, as a way to fuel growth, a wonderful idea. Things to think about. How willing is the owner to transition the business 
over the course of months, if not longer. If a, if a seller of a business is looking to be out yesterday, if they're looking to, for somebody to take the keys and head to Florida, we got ourselves a big old red flag. Red flag. What's the age of the key staff members? And when are those people going to need to be replaced? Not to be unkind, but if the average age at the shop, and I see this a lot in the trades, is you know, average age in the 50s, or you know, not uncommon to have folks in their, in their late 50s, 60s, even older, that's a massive consideration. What does turnover look like? How much churn do we have on the team or in the industry? What are the skill sets of the people that work there? And, and are they trainable? Are they coachable? Are they malleable? Are they willing to take on more if a tangentially related company or industry is looking to grow into a new sector? What kind of technology, technological threats are we facing? And what you know, impact will AI or anything else you can dream of have? These are all factors to consider when thinking in terms of, all right, here's what, we, here's what we've built. Here's what kind of money we make. Here's the kind of lifestyle that we're enjoying. Here's what we think the next year, two, five, 10 are gonna look like. What is our path? What is our plan? How do we ready ourselves? There are myriad things to consider, but I come back to the point that whether the business is, uh, is, has stagnated whether the business has yet to recover from COVID, whether the business is in a sector or industry where we're not sure what the future holds. All of these have, when I say have value to someone somewhere for some amount of money at some point, it's just a matter of frog kissing. It's a matter of door knocking. It's a matter of Phone calling, some of the most old fashioned sales methodologies that you can think of. Some of you probably came up this way, right? <laughs> there, there was no other way to go out and win business than to go out and approach people cold. As technology has a bigger and bigger impact that I see in sales and marketing, the old school ways of approaching people to see what their interest level are, those are all coming flooding back for anybody willing to do such things. And I encourage people to think about the willingness to pick up the phone or to go onto LinkedIn to you know, look around, to dream a little bit about what's another industry that might have interest in this? How do we create competition for the sale of this business? These are all big factors in making sure that whether you've been in the business for years or decades, that there's a celebration, that there's a, a, a reward, that there's, a, that there's a, even a modest pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So I wish you well if those are your plans. Thank you very much. Chris is a small token of our appreciation. I want to present you with a chamber pen. And a good pen, by the way. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yep. It's now my pleasure to welcome Secretary of Housing, Ed Augustus. Edward M. Augustus serves as the state's first housing secretary in more than 30 years. Uh, he helped create thousands of new housing units at all income level, levels during his tenure in Worcester. He now leads uh, Governor Healy's new executive office of housing and livable communities. As city manager of Worcester, he functions as the chief administrative and executive officer of the gateway city of more than 200,000 people. During his tenure, he oversaw the commitment or distribution of $25 million to develop or preserve more than 2,000 affordable housing units throughout the city. And Worcester is a city with the third largest subsidized housing inventory in the state. Augustus also dedicated 30 million of ARPA funds for the housing, uh, including 15 million for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. As city manager, Augustus managed a $750 million budget, as well as a $90 million 20-year urban revitalization plan. Notably, he spearheaded the $240 million landmark uh, redevelopment of the um, Worcester's Canal District 
including the relocation of the former Paw Sox to Worcester, now the Woo Sox, and also the construction of the extraordinary Polar Park. Prior to joining the city of Worcester, Augustus served in various roles as Director of Government and, Gov and Community Relations for the College of Holy Cross, State Senator for the 2nd Worcester District, Chief of Staff for Congressman Jim McGovern, and Chief of Staff to the Assistant Secretary for Intergovernment and Interagency Affairs at the U.S. Department of Education under the President Clinton administration. He most recently served as Chancellor at Dean College. Please welcome Ed Augustus. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate that introduction. I did tell him to leave out the part about being born in a manger, um, <laughs> just to save some time. Um, it's great to be here. I want to thank uh, Chris and the Metro South Chamber for inviting me today and giving me an opportunity to speak to you about a pressing issue uh, confronting our Commonwealth, uh, the housing crisis. Uh, so by way of background, uh, some of you may remember during the campaign a year plus ago when Governor Healy uh, was candidate Healy running to be governor of Massachusetts uh, and she and who ultimately became her running mate uh, Kim Driscoll uh, now our lieutenant governor at the time the mayor of Salem were crisscrossing Massachusetts talking to groups talking to business organizations talking to labor organizations talking to community groups and literally every audience that they would go before uh, talked about housing. What are you going to do to help take some of the pressure off uh, our employees, uh, our residents, our workers uh, in terms of housing? And so one of the things that they committed to during that campaign was to do something that hadn't been done for 30 years. So it was the end of the Dukakis administration, the last time that we had a Secretary of Housing uh, in the Commonwealth. When Governor Weld came in, he took the Economic Development Secretary and the Housing Secretary and he merged them into one. And that's where they existed for the next 30 years, Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, but the governor, lieutenant governor, believed that this moment, we needed somebody who woke up every day, focused uh, like a laser beam on housing, particularly on housing production. How do we build more housing? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this really is an issue of supply demand. Uh, there simply is not enough supply of housing, and housing of all types, not only rental housing, uh, but ownership opportunities. And if you think about it, and I'm sure everybody in this room either you've had this experience yourself, uh, or maybe your children have had this experience, or people you work with have had this experience, but how many people know somebody who's tried to buy their first home uh, and put in an offer and been outbid by 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, waive home inspections, you know, do all sorts of things that aren't always in your best interest, just so desperate to try to get that home uh, and begin to build equity and all the good things that come from home ownership. Well, after a while, folks start to say to themselves and say to each other, maybe Massachusetts isn't a place uh, that we can buy a home and we need to think about other options for us. Same thing in the rental side. How many folks have employees or family members who maybe you've got a couple kids, a single mom, trying to find a affordable, decent place to live close to where they work so they're not spending all their time on transportation and, and dollars on transportation costs and can't find that opportunity and have to live further and further away from where they work. Uh, and what that means for childcare, what that means for quality of life, what that means for our climate goals, putting people in cars uh, and longer commutes and more time away from their kids uh, and, and the quality of life. That's the challenges that we're facing. It really is an existential threat to Massachusetts's future, the lack of affordable housing for people who are coming out of our great colleges and universities like Stonehill, students who Massachusetts in many ways has helped lift up and educate from preschool all the way to higher ed. Uh, talented, smart people who are just about to make big contributions not only to their own careers and families but to the Commonwealth, to the greater good. And at that moment, 
when they get an offer from a Massachusetts-based company and they get an offer from a company in North Carolina and they look around and they say, oh my God, I'm going to have to spend 50% of my income to stay here in Massachusetts and I'm going to spend 30% of my income in another state, too often they're making what is not always an irrational decision to say, all right, I'm going there. And you know what? That's dumb public policy. When you spend lots of time and money and energy educating a, a talented workforce and then exporting them to another state to reap all the benefits from. And Massachusetts is not a dumb state. We're a smart state. And so we need to align our public policies and our funding opportunities to stop that migration of talent out of Massachusetts to allow our employers to be competitive again in terms of the talent uh, that drives uh, their companies and their businesses, that adds to the tax base of our communities and the quality of life uh, for all of us, people contributing and, and participating and paying taxes and buying things and stimulating our economy. And so on June 1st, uh, with the help of the legislature, and I know we've got a lot of our great legislators here and we want to thank them uh, for their partnership, uh, the legislature approved and the governor signed uh, into being the new Secretariat of Housing and Livable Communities, June 1st, uh, and that was the day I started as Secretary. And one of my first responsibilities was to put a great team together, which I think we've done, uh, but then very quickly come up with a set of recommendations that the governor could propose to the legislature that would really move the needle on housing production, help address the crisis that's before us. Uh, and that process was a very, busy one uh, where we went out and met with about 120 different stakeholder groups. Uh, we tried to collect the best ideas, the best suggestions, the best practices. We looked at what other states were doing so that we weren't reinventing the wheel, uh, what is working in other places in terms of housing production. And we came up with a set of recommendations that we then wanted to turn into a legislative vehicle. And you know, one of the opportunities that we saw right in front of us was a bond bill. Uh, and for the legislators in the room, they get this. It's typically a piece of housekeeping business. Every five years, you need to pass a new uh, bond bill to authorize the capital expenditures uh, for that particular area, in this case, for housing production and housing preservation. Um, and you know, it's a, every bond bill tends to be the biggest bond bill in the history of bond bills because it's five years later and you need to adjust it for inflation. Well, we took it to another level with this bond bill, and it's two and a half times bigger than the previous bond bill. $4.1 billion of authorizations that we're asking for. And so we looked at the bond bill, again, that piece of kind of housekeeping, pushed the envelope on the amounts that we were asking for, uh, that $4.1 billion. So things like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we got some developers, we got uh, mayors and municipal leaders, you know what that is. We're doubling that in this bill. What does that mean? It means we get to say yes to more projects uh, that you want to build in your cities and towns that create more units of affordable housing. Um, things like uh, the, the uh, capital improvements to our public housing. You may or may not know Massachusetts has one of the, doesn't have one of the most, it has the most robust portfolio of state-owned public housing in the United States. There are federal units all over the place, but we're the only state that has 43,000 plus units of state-owned public housing. That's great. That's an important part of our safety net system. There are a lot of folks who have very little income, and this is one of the only options available for them to stay in their communities uh, and be here in Massachusetts. The problem is we have not historically invested in the capital improvements necessary to keep those units online, to keep them healthy, to keep them safe, and certainly not investing and in, in advancing our climate goals. We know housing is one of the biggest producers of carbon emissions, and so if we're gonna to get to our climate goals, we've gotta decarbonize our housing stock. And this bill really tries to move that forward by tripling the capital investments in public housing to $1.6 billion over the next five years, so that public housing is safe, and healthy and dignified. And we're also gonna to try to advance our climate goals with $150 million 
of that $1.6 billion that's set aside specifically to decarbonize our public housing stock. So we advance our housing goals. And we're leading by example as a commonwealth, owning this many units of housing. If we're going to ask everybody to help decarbonize our housing stock, we need to show the way. We need to lead by example. And we're trying to do that with this bill. And there's a number of other things, things like subsidized, uh, supportive housing, rather. Uh, for a lot of folks, whether they're trying to exit homelessness uh, and get back uh, on their feet, we know that the unit of housing often needs to be supported by wraparound services if we're going to keep, keep that individual rehoused. Uh, we have uh, programs in this bill uh, to try to move that forward. So there's the authorization side of the bill, but then we said, all right, we're going to do something not typical, which is to put 28 policy proposals attached to the bond recommendation that we've sent to the legislature. Those 28 proposals are big and they're bold and they're going to move the needle on housing production. Example, accessory dwelling units as of right. Uh, this is something that's been talked about for a long time. Uh, the idea that if you have a garage or you have a walkout basement or an attic that could be converted to a unit of housing, a one bedroom, a studio. Uh, sometimes they're perfect for an elderly parent uh, who's living in a big house by themselves now, maybe the house that you grew up in. You want to keep them a little close uh, as they're aging in place and keep an eye and provide some support. But what it also does is it frees up that big three bedroom house for a family that's growing that needs that kind of space. A lot of times seniors want to stay in the community that they grew up in there faith community is there. Everybody and everything they know is there and they want to stay there, but there's not an option that's affordable to them to stay in that community. By allowing the creation of these accessory dwelling units, we provide opportunities for seniors to stay in the community uh, that they want to be in, free up uh, some of that other housing that's uh, necessary for a growing family. Uh, and the good news is that's at no cost to the Commonwealth. No subsidies needed, private homeowners decide if that makes sense for them, uh, and they do that on their own. We conservatively estimate that eight to 10,000 units of new housing can be created just with that one policy change alone. And again, we're not really leading the way here. California did that. They created over 40,000 units of new housing uh, with that one uh, change. Most of the New England states have already done that as well. Uh, so there's an opportunity here to really tweak some of our policies and create more units of housing, again, not needing new subsidies and new programs to do that, just aligning our policies with what uh, the needs of our residents uh, are as a state. Uh, something that's a little more controversial, something called a transfer fee. The idea that property that sells for over a million dollars, that the amount above a million dollars, could have a half a percent or a one percent or a two percent uh, charge added to that if the city or town opts in. So this is up to the city or town. We've got a good mayor of Brockton here. If Brockton decided to do that and it made sense to them, they could opt in. If they chose not to do that, then nothing would change. Again, empowering our local communities to decide what tools make the most sense for them. And then there would be a pool of dollars at the local level that could be used in a whole number of ways to preserve or uh, create affordable housing units. Something called naturally occurring affordable housing. What does that mean? That means those are the units that exist in every city and town in Massachusetts. Sometimes it's a, a family may own a 12 unit apartment building in town. Uh, and they know their tenants and they keep the rents relatively low because they've got good tenants and they just want to have a, a good, reliable source of income, but they also want to be decent to the people that they're renting to. Sometimes when those properties change hands, speculators or developers come in and say, hey, you're only getting $800. You could be getting $1,700 for that unit. And all of a sudden, that affordable housing is gone. Uh, and the people who live there are often gone as well. Uh, and we need to have some tools in the toolbox so that if local communities said, hey, we want to buy that property or we want to engage that property owner and maybe get an affordability restriction on, just like we do on property sometimes that is in environmentally sensitive areas. Maybe we don't buy the property, but we buy a restriction on that property so it's not developed in a way that uh, harms a water source 
a drinking water supply source. So we <clears throat> put a restriction on the property owner gets the money, but they promise not to develop it or sell it. In this case, the property owner would get some cash from the local community with the idea they wouldn't raise rents uh, beyond uh, inflation each year. Preserve some of that locally, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, because it's a challenge when, with all the subsidies and all the programs that we're providing, we're putting all of those tools and those new units into the bucket, but if the bucket keeps springing holes uh, and some of these naturally occurring affordable are going away, uh, we don't make the kind of progress that we need to be making if we're going to meet this problem. Uh, so there's a lot of those policy ideas uh, I could go on, uh, but a lot of things that we estimate that combined with the uh, new dollars and the policy changes would create or preserve 70,000 units of housing that otherwise would not be created or preserved. That puts us on track over 10 years to meet the 200,000 units uh, that we estimate that we need to take some of the pressure off, right? If you think about it, the power dynamic in the housing ecosystem is out of kilter, right? All the power goes to whoever has what's in large demand but short supply. Um, and what we need to do is restore a little bit of that power dynamic. So that if you think somebody's asking a crazy rent, well, there's two or three or five more places that you can go and take your business there. And that naturally, we're using the market forces to say, okay, uh, I gotta keep my rent reasonable because I've got competition out here. Or if you're selling houses, you've gotta keep it in a reasonable range because somebody could go to the next open house and find what they're looking for. Uh, right now, if you're a buyer or renter, you have very little power in this market. Uh, and that's why we're seeing some of the things that we're seeing. So we really think that this bill, along with two things that the legislature did and that the governor signed over the sum of the tax bill. Uh, there are a lot of great things in that tax bill. Two things related to housing that we're especially excited about. The HDIP tax credit, and I know Brockton's put this to really good use uh, over the years. Uh, that was funded at $10 million. I used it quite a bit in Worcester uh, when we were doing projects. We, the legislature and the governor tripled that to $30 million a year. Uh, and then they did a one-time allocation of $57 million to deal with the backlog of projects. Huge help to our gateway cities. That's a program for market rate housing in our gateway cities. We know, and I spoke to somebody already in the room today, who's got a couple projects ready to come in and we're getting ready to open up a round on that. And that will unlock thousands of units of market rate housing in our gateway cities. And then coupled with that, is the LIHTC program, LIHTC tax credits, low-income housing tax credits. The legislature and the governor took that from $40 million a year and brought it up to $60 million a year. Significant increase. That's the workhorse of affordable housing production. Uh, so our theory of the case, if you will, is those additional tax credits, the policy changes and the new uh, funding authorizations in the bond bill, are going to allow us to really supercharge housing production in Massachusetts and take some of the pressure off uh, the housing ecosystem and create more supply uh, to meet the demand that's out there and restore, restore some of the power dynamic uh, in this space and allow all of that talent uh, that we are producing here in Massachusetts and attracting here in Massachusetts to say we want to stay here. Because we think about housing also as a life cycle. If you think about the housing that you were looking for when you were getting out of college, maybe with a few friends, you were going to rent an apartment for a few years out of college, that was a different type of housing than you were looking for when you got married and you started your family. And it's a different kind of housing that you're, that you're looking for when you're empty nesters and you're starting to think about aging in place. And what we need to do as a state is be able to produce enough housing so that you can do all of those life cycles here in Massachusetts. Right. So I could go on and on. I look at your faces and can tell you're worried I will. So <laughs> I'm going to stop there uh, and open it up for some questions. Uh, but I, again, thank you for the opportunity to share some ideas with you today.
test. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, that, that was a, a great talk. Uh, uh, questions. How is your office addressing housing funding for lower income communities that are often more diverse with more affluent communities that are often less diverse but have more space? Uh, this is especially important as a small business wants to be uh, in the sub wants to be located in suburbs to avoid traffic into Boston. Uh, for example, Easton is a beautiful small town, uh, but often expensive. Two fisted here. Uh, <laughs> If I'm understanding the question correctly, the distinction between smaller communities that may be more affluent and larger communities that may, might be more diverse uh, uh, and maybe have some less resources. So again, Massachusetts is very different, right? Cities and towns have different characters, they have different demographics, they have different challenges and different needs. And I do think that we recognize that as a a state and the array of programs that we have. I mentioned the HDIP program, which is really for our gateway cities, uh, understanding that our gateway cities have some unique opportunities and challenges and needs so that we have unique programs. There's something else in the bill that's called seasonal communities designation, further recognizing the fact that all cities and towns are not the same. Uh, when you go to Cape Cod, uh, and you talk to folks at Cape Cod, they would tell you 50% of the Cape's workforce lives off the Cape. Think about that for one minute, as many small business owners, municipal officials. 50% of the employees, your preschool teachers, your DPW employees, the folks who clean hotel rooms and motel rooms and work in restaurants, the tourism industry that's the lifeblood of the Cape, 50% of them have to live off the Cape to find an affordable place to live. So that's a lot of folks spending time on those bridges, on those clogged roads. Uh, a lot of times folks can't find people to fill those jobs. And so you've got municipal services that are very taxed in terms of being able to deliver what they're supposed to because they can't find the people to do the jobs. And you've heard those stories the last few uh, seasons in terms of hotels, motels, restaurants, having shorter hours, et cetera, because they can't find people able to do that. Why? Because a lot of the rental properties on the Cape got turned into Airbnbs. And so we need to have different tools for places like that, and this is including some of the places out in the Berkshire that may see their population triple uh, between you know, June, July, and August. So we need different tools for different communities because they have different challenges. So uh, the one size fits all certainly doesn't make any sense. And we do try to have an array of programs. Well, still on the uh, subject of HDIP, HDIP makes housing development possible uh, in Brockton. Can we count <coughs> on HDIP funding at 50 or $100 million level for the next five years? Or if not, what kind of funding can we expect? Uh, so again, a very big thank you to the legislature for appreciating the importance of HDIP and the difference it makes in housing production. Uh, they tripled it, which is, is a, a big move uh, to triple it from 10 million to 30 million a year, and then acknowledging the backlog of projects uh, and giving us a one-time $57 million authorization. So. Uh, I think that's a very, and, and our sense is, talking to developers, we're going to be able to get to a lot of the projects that are in the pipeline or that are uh, imminently on the horizon. So we think this is sufficient to really meet the, the demand that's out there now, and we'll have to monitor it uh, along with our legislative partners going forward and see if in the future we need to make any uh, other adjustments to it. Subject is accessory apartments. Uh, will the state provide septic system funding for homeowners uh, to add accessory apartments? That's not part of the current proposal. Uh, that doesn't mean that's not something that could be looked at at some future point. What we're trying to do now is kind of, our, our, we talk about our charge from the governor is more faster. Uh, and so within three or four months of becoming a secretariat, we created this bill. Uh, so. 
this was only the first quick thing out of the box to really try to get some new ideas uh, before the legislature for their consideration. We are kicking off next week something called the Unlocking Housing Production Commission, which was an executive order that the governor signed at the same time she filed the bill. And that commission's job is to come up with what are the other barriers to housing production. Are there local zoning issues and other uh, issues at the local level that inhibit housing production? And at the state level, are we getting in the way with regulations that maybe are very you know, useful in advancing one goal but have an unintended impact on another goal? Uh, and so how do we make sure we're not in the way of housing production uh, at the state level through our regulations? So this commission is going to be charged with coming up with those. And my thought is at the end of that process, that might be another legislative vehicle uh, that we share those ideas, those findings with the legislature for their uh, consideration during the next session. So things like uh, additional incentives or other things that if we think it would make a difference in really creating more uh, accessory dwelling units in the case of that question, you know, there'd be an opportunity to look at that in the future. What advice do you have for the mayor of Brockton, the Brockton housing developers here today, for building more housing? Should the city hire a housing navigator to help? Um, I don't think the mayor of Brockton needs any advice from me. He's, <laughs> he's, he's hitting it out of the park. I've been there a couple of times and seen all of the housing that he's building, and I know. Um, that he's got a lot in the pipeline. So what Brockton is doing is working. Uh, it's making a difference. So uh, we're happy to be partners with him. How will the state address smaller cities and towns that continue to avoid affordable housing? Well, there's something called the MBTA Communities Act, uh, which was passed by the legislature and uh, the previous governor that the implementation of which is falling on this administration uh, that cities and towns, at least 177 cities and towns who fall within the footprint of the MBTA Communities Law, which is primarily communities that have some amount of public transportation options in the different categories of uh, those communities, have to create zones around those public transportation nodes that would allow, as of right, uh, multifamily housing, more dense housing in those areas. Again, it's often considered smart uh, growth, where you put housing proximate to public transportation options. So folks could theoretically walk to the train or walk to the bus line, uh, take a, a public transportation option to work, to school. Uh, that's gonna help us get our climate goals. It helps with you know, mobility and transportation. So we're working with cities and towns. We've put out about $6 million worth of technical assistance grants to communities that are within the MBTA community zone. We want to be partners with those local communities to help them figure out the zones that, yes, meet the law, but also work for them, that makes sense for them. Um, and so <clears throat> a number of communities have made the changes. The transit communities had to have their plans in at the end of December. The bulk of the communities will have to have their plans in by the end of December of this year. Uh, and again, uh, we're seeing good uh, efforts uh, on the part of communities, and we look forward to keeping working with them. Uh, with the growing senior population, how many of the new housing units will be actually set aside, especially for seniors? Um, we do fund a number of uh, projects that uh, kind of work with the senior uh, demographic. I know we've got a lot of uh, our folks who work in the homeless uh, space and, and work with uh, the homeless population. I think they would tell you, because they've told me, that one of the biggest growth uh, populations of the individual homeless population, not the families that you know we talk about with the migrant crisis, but the individual are seniors. And I can't think of anything more sad than thinking about somebody who's in their 70s or their 80s they worked their whole life, they raised their family, they did everything right, uh, and that, at that vulnerable stage of life found themselves living in a car or a shelter uh, or otherwise housing insecure. Uh, we have to do better for the folks who built uh, our communities and built uh, our commonwealth. And so sometimes that means uh, senior housing, sometimes that means senior supported housing uh, because we know a lot of the seniors uh, 
often need supports in order to stay independent, stay healthy. Uh, and some of that has to do with just being engaged with the world. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk in the public health space about loneliness. Uh, your world shrinks when you uh, retire and when you lose your spouse, your world shrinks. And if you're not engaged with the world and you're not stimulated by having people around you, um, it often has very poor health outcomes. Uh, and so our housing is one of the ways how we build our housing, how we build the supports in our housing can be one of the ways not only to do right by our seniors, but get better health outcomes also. So uh, we are uh, gonna have a special commission on elderly housing. It's a big part of the demographic growth in Massachusetts. So we gotta be thinking of more creatively about options for seniors. So not only are we funding projects for seniors, but we're also gonna be trying to innovate around the space of what our senior population uh, is gonna need. And, um, I'm rapidly approaching that uh, category myself, so I'm very interested in the topic. <laughs> yeah, some of us are. Uh, is there any kind of a communication plan to educate the suburban cities of the importance of housing issues, the new zoning requirements in MPTA towns? Yeah, we have a number of partners that we work with, Mass Housing Partnership, CHAPA, others who are providing technical assistance and sometimes also providing outreach and education opportunities. Things like this are an opportunity for us to get in front of audiences and talk a little bit about it. Um, certainly reach out to my office uh, if you are part of a community group or organization that wants to get somebody to talk to your group or organization a little bit more about um, the obligations and the opportunities around the MBTA Communities Act. The one thing I think we need to do a lot about, not specific to MBTA communities, but in general, is a little myth busting around um, the whole issue of housing production. I know a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I, I, I'm okay with senior housing, but I don't really want family housing, because family housing means you're gonna bring a lot more kids to the town, it means we're gonna have to build more schools, and that means taxes go up. And there's a lot of myths. If you look at the demographic trends in Massachusetts, our, school populations are dwindling. It's a big challenge for colleges. Um, and so there's a lot of towns where the student population is actually going down. Uh, so if you, and the chapter 70 formula gives aid to cities and towns to support their schools, you know, one of the big factors in that is what's the student enrollment. If your student enrollment goes down, your chapter 70 funding goes down, the aid from the state goes down. So in some cases, communities could really use some more young people in the town if you want to keep that funding level up uh, so you don't lay off teachers and cut programs. So, you know, some of those ancient kind of, you know, notions that we have about this stuff turn out to be wrong or not current. Uh, so it's really important to educate yourselves and educate your communities about, all right, what's true and what isn't true. And, the things that are true that are challenges, how do we work through those? And the things that aren't true anymore, all right, let's get rid of those as, as an excuse why we can't do more housing production. Great, final question. What's the likelihood that conservation uh, regulations will ease up to allow for more affordable housing? Um, that really is not in my bailiwick, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dodge that question very gently if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I was speaking at the North Shore Alliance in Salem yesterday. I got a similar question. I think I don't know if this is what they're trying to get at. There's some concern that some communities may use opportunities to create open space and big swaths of land as a way to kind of say, all right. It's not that we don't want housing, but we love open space and we love the environment. Well, we need to love both. Uh, we need to f strike the right balance. It's gonna be different in different communities. The opportunities, the open space, uh, you know, uh, opportunities and challenges in different communities are gonna be different, but we've gotta strike the balance between making sure we're protecting our environment and our open space, and that we have enough housing so that the preschool teacher that you desperately want to be able to have in your school system can afford to live in your town. It's not some other town's responsibility to make sure you can have DPW workers and you can have preschool teachers or you can have the person who works at Starbucks or the grocery store that you count on being in your community. 
it's all of our responsibilities to make sure those folks that we rely on, that we called heroes just a couple of years ago during the pandemic, that they can live with us too, in our neighborhoods, in our communities too. It's not some other community's job to make sure they have a decent place to live. That's all our job, so thank you. Small token of our appreciation. Another fifty bucks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, a few updates here. The next uh, Good Morning Metro South uh, is scheduled for Thursday, February 15th at Thorny Lee Golf Club. Uh, February's Good Morning uh, Metro South will actually be a, a lunch edition. We should probably call it that, you know. So it's going to begin at 11.45 and will feature State of the City's Economic uh, Development speech uh, with our, our Mayor Robert Sullivan. Also Dr. Mark Melnick, Economic an um, analyst with the UMass Donahue Institute will be uh, there as well. And the event is sponsored by OCES. Other dates to save. Thursday, February 29th, 9th Annual Multicultural and Business Forum at Thorny Lee Golf Club from 5 to 7.30 p.m. And this is sponsored by Northeast Savings Bank, Northeastern Savings Bank, excuse me. Thursday, March 28th, the Chamber will host Massachusetts Secretary of Economic Development, Yvonne Howe, for a very, very special luncheon at Concord Foods in Brockton. Okay. Now we have door prizes. And as you know, each uh, uh, edition of Good Morning or Good Day Metro South, we randomly select one company to be highlighted in an upcoming action report. And the winner is uh, Preeti Sekri, Holiday Inn. Aww. Next prize is a $25 American Express gift card. And oh, one of our Chamber Ambassadors has won. I wonder who that is. Felicita Sepulveda, Cape Verde Association. Come on up. We have one more American Express gift card here. And this one goes to Cheryl McCormick, SCU Credit Union. And the winner of the first prize, I, sh I should have mentioned, uh, please see Emma on the way out and she'll, she'll get your, your information so that you can appear in the action report. I have a few people to thank for helping us put this on today. Ben Ross, photos. Brockton Community Access Channel, the Enterprise News, and of course, our wonderful staff members. We have a very small but excellent staff, Naldo and Emma, of the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> our hosts, Martin Institute at Stonehill College, Doug Smith and Dr. Kathleen Curl Dugman. <laughs> our corporate sponsor, Jennifer Carey of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And finally, we'd like to thank our speakers, Chris Bond, manager of Times Up LLC. And of course, our Secretary of Housing, Edward Augustus, for being with us today. Finally, I ask our developers and elected selected officials to come to the stage for some photos. And folks, 
Come on up for photos. Um, that's it. That concludes our program today. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody.